David, welcome back to the DTFH. I am, what day are we on now with your meditation challenge? Ten, let me look here. 10, is it 10 days? Yeah, 11 now, because I just met it. We just did our group meditation. So 11 days straight, which for me is actually pretty astounding. I, yeah. I, I think I've made it for like four days in a row or something, but never 11 days straight. So thanks. Well, we should clarify what the challenge is, right? Oh, yeah. Right. So this is called the Nudgy Challenge, because that's my nickname, Nudgy. And it's very simple. You just do mindfulness meditation for 20 minutes a day minimum every day for 30 days. That's the original challenge. And some people, not to, you know, create too much intimidation here, are up to like a day 150 or 160. They just re-up. We call right. it tier two and tier three, you know, once you do the 30 days. And the only, the only downside is if you miss a day, you go back to day one. There's no fresh start. Go back to day one. Wait, if you do 60 and you miss a day, you don't go back to 30? <laughs> Wait, if we're going to create different days. Why, why would you go all the way back to one? Nobody else has negotiated before. It's interesting. That's oh, great. You're a good I've negotiator. Side of people who don't pull it off every day for 60 days. We need a lawyer here. Well, we, yeah, I mean, I think in your case, we could add a, a clause. A subordinate clause, a Santa clause, that says, okay, if you make it to 30 and you go for tier two, you only go back to, to day 31. Okay. You, you well, have, you, I you, but now I always was taught if I negotiate and I give something up, I have to get something in return. So what are you offering in return? Double the commitment. So if you go back and you get to keep your 30, you now have to commit to 60. Okay. Meaning, so in other words, you have to do it for 60 days straight. Oh, okay. Double or nothing kind of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. That's a clause. All right. But I, you know, the, I really, anytime I, I have pulled off daily meditation, which has been difficult for me in the past, um, you know, I, I really do find myself somewhat confused, uh, by, uh, May, what maybe is a, a misunderstanding or miscommunication regarding meditation, particularly Buddhist meditation, that this is supposed to be a thing that we don't have any reason for doing. That, in fact... Uh, 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 according to who? Exactly. I don't even know where I got that from. Yeah. but I, I don't think Buddha would have said that. Okay, cool. <laughs> he said, yeah. There's a very good reason to do it. Well, it's, it's, you know, what, what I mean is like suddenly there's this kind of like monet, monetization uh, of the practice. In other words, like now I'm not just sitting. And, and this, and, but I, by the way, I'm glad. I don't care what the method, like if something is getting me sitting every day, I love it. And I love it not just because like suddenly there's a feeling of like, holy shit, I'm a little more in control of my life, but also, because somehow, coincidentally, whenever I start sitting, the poodle, the poodle's barks are a little less piercing. The you know the convergence of madness or chaos that can happen in a family, you know, dog shit on the floor, the poodle's barking. Forrest is like practicing a banshee shriek now, where he like has the most high pitched shriek, and they're all happening at once. You know, so it's not like that doesn't. It's not like that stops bothering me, but it doesn't bother me to the degree it used to. And, and uh, to me, that's, one, that's wonderful. So I love it. I don't, what I'm saying is thanks, and I don't care if it's breaking some bullshit spirit. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to clarify just a couple of things, you know, we're trying to take a lighthearted approach to this, right? Guilt-free, yeah. guilt-free. I mean, you know, Maybe some of us were raised with guilt as a sort of like strong motivation, but it's not really a good motivator. It's because it leaves too much uh, stain on the bathtub. <laughs> it leaves a ring around the tub. <laughs> and um, and the other thing is just, you know, it seems to be good to have a little playfulness and a little accountability for it. And, it, and then uh, people get into a groove. And there's no doubt at all that if you just study how the mind works and the brain works, that regularity, 
you know, steadiness is a, is a positive influence. If, if it's not too rigid, it's a really positive. Right. Try to train in anything, you know, try to train to become a long distance runner or a guitar player. You know, regularity right. is good for it. Right. Yeah. And the, but also, and again, this is all stuff that I've, I've read, but now it, it makes more and more sense. It seems like if, you know, reading about spiritual stuff, the Dharma, whatever it is, if you, reading like reading that stuff without a regular practice it's like trying to read without glasses when you need glasses there's a, a quality to it that's just all theoretical and then something about the practice it it makes some of the stuff that i'm currently studying much more clear and like a, there's more of a reference point yeah well like study uh, pr- uh, study without practice is like trying to take a crap with the toilet seat down. Oh, wow. That's, I've never heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there has to be some kind of space for all that to go into oh, yeah. and to be processed. And, yeah. Um, yeah, you know that. We, you know, in our our way of going about the Buddhist tradition, the way I learned it is study and practice are very important both, you know. Yeah. Well, I was thinking in terms of like, sitting in the bathtub and just rubbing dry soap all over your body. You know, it's like no water. You mean no water. Like you gotta need both for there to be an effect. Um, But this is the point I I want to, I think people are probably curious about in, which is, you know, whenever I'm leading these group meditations, I say every time I'm a practitioner, I don't, I'm not anything I'm saying right now is easily wrong like and and literally wrong not humble but literally like i was listening to some buddhist i'm listening to this wonderful book um by minger rinpoche and um i'm trying to think of the exact point oh he was talking about licking honey off a razor blade as a metaphor for suffering and i completely misunderstood what that meant and had been like proclaiming it to mean something very different (laughs) than at least what this trained Buddhist monk was saying. But my point is I feel I get recently more than usual. People reach out to me saying, how do you find a a teacher? Hmm. How do you find a guru? Does does that really matter? And because I, and I remember in earlier days before we started working together, I always felt kind of like, well, I'm not really doing it because I don't have the presence of someone who has some experience with this in, in, in my life. And I am just, you know, you know, winging it, so to speak. So what do you, what do you have to say regarding that sort of classical um, formation when it comes to studying Dharma? Well, so, um, you know, since we decided we were going to talk today, I thought, well, we're really having an ongoing conversation with kind of, you know, commas and pauses, but it's evolving conversation. Yes. And and that's kind of great a great aspect of it. So I think what's happening, and this is a little bit of a broad stroke, but what's happening a lot in the world is meditation is being introduced. It's like a first date over and over and over again. So, yeah. um, and, and people are not kind of, often in a situation where they can evolve or, 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 or progress their sense of, of what, what it's all about with any kind of uh, increasing nuance. So I thought today it might be interesting to kind of like um, explore the possibility of what, what a little more nuanced look at what meditation is in, this, in, the, in the Buddhist way of thinking about it. Yeah. And... Um, rather than just a first aid of, okay, it's mindfulness, you sit and you breathe. Because I think what's happening is the world's right. getting saturated with the, with the first date aspect of Buddhism. Right. And nobody's, you know, in general, not offering um, some of these apps and things are not offering a kind of progressed path where you could actually develop right. and go deeper. So traditionally to go deeper, there is some notion of like, uh, it's hard to do without steady stabilizing your kind of area of involvement like it'd be like equivalent of, you know in, in remember in, in elementary school you had to choose an instrument to be in the orchestra yes and you know oh, i'll play every instrument you know and okay well you know um 
you'd only go so deep with each one then. Right. So it doesn't matter in a way what you're drawn to and what you choose, but it does matter the idea of going in deeper at a certain point to, right. to develop some kind of a nuanced uh, approach to it. So that's what's happening. I think that's my version of the now line of the, of the kind of meditation tradition, um, maybe in the West, maybe the East too, is how would you go deeper into it and develop a, uh, um, uh, the possibility of expanding or um, whatever qualities you think you're developing in the first place, developing them further. Right. You know? So for example, mindfulness is a good quality. I think most people would agree. No big deal. I mean, paying attention to what you're doing is a kind of generic idea and not that religious and not that specific. Right. And it's, reflected in sports and it's reflected in business and you know in family life being mindful is a good thing so what where does that evolve towards what 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 would what would that open the gate for and the real uh issue is that we start with mindfulness which is in in uh, sanskrit it's called shamatha in tibetan shine and it's developing focus. You become more focused. So yeah, the dogs are barking, but you go, okay, well, I don't have to have my mind stolen away by that. Right. You know? Then the next tier, which I think is what's going to come up now for people, is awareness aspect of, of the meditative practice, which is called vipassana or vipassana, um, lagtong in Tibetan. So, and I call it in English discovery. You start to notice stuff. Yeah. You start to become more, like you said, I'm noticing the dogs barking. I'm noticing my mental reaction to that. I'm noticing the history of that. I'm noticing the pattern of that. I'm noticing the feeling in my body when I get agitated. Yeah. Uh, I'm noticing the look in your eyes when you look at me and I'm about to lose my mind. You know, so yeah. that's Vipassana. That, and, and what they say is that sort of awareness, but it also develops insight and perspective. And I think that's the next step for a lot of people is to understand what what that is um, and it goes from there that's not even really the full iteration because then um, in Vipassana you start to notice that there's more space which is I think what you're describing yeah in that more space the the, the kind of throbbing of the ego becomes a little bit less kind of all pervasive and and you begin to notice um, that there's more space than you thought there was and in fact that the things you were filling the space with are not that substantial in the first place. right does yeah. any of that make sense? That's what I was sort of thinking we could get into today a little yeah, bit. I, yeah. I, so it, it sounds like what you're saying is regarding the teacher thing, it's just good to go deeper into whatever the particular practice is. Like, like there's always going to be something more than just what you're going to pick up in the first like co co commercial book with a cool cover and an awesome name. Like, which is also um, what I love about uh, the lineage of Buddhism that you we, we've been working with, that you teach me, I love it because it's Jesus, God in heaven. It's so much more than that. Like, can you pick it up? You know, when I'm listening to, when I'm chatting with you or when I'm practicing or when I'm listening or, you know, when I just, just decide to like pull up some kind of aspect of Tibetan Buddhism online. And then you realize just how psychedelic and deep and wild it is. It's really quite beautiful. Um, but I thought maybe one way into like what you're suggesting we talk about is um, intention. Uh, well, and Duncan, let me interrupt for one second. Sorry. Um, but I, you're right. I didn't really address the teacher issue of what you asked. I, I sort of, I, I, I kind of talked about the general um, sense of learning and going deep. Yeah. So uh, here's, for example, nuance is, is perfect when you're talking about a teacher. So in, in our tradition, it's kind of there's three sort of stages of teaching that, and, and being a teacher, which we teach this in the teacher training program that, that we have. The, you know. And the first level is just a kind of elder, you know, somebody who's um, you know, worked with that equation for a while and has some idea about how to pass that forward. So it's not, it's not a guru. You know, that's yeah. the thing is people, that's another un nuanced thing. You say, oh, I got to find a guru. Well, what, what do you mean somebody to turn you into a slave and tell you what to do every minute of your life? Yeah. You yeah. don't need that. Yeah. You need somebody to tell you how, how to sit down and meditate or how to, you know, how to work with the situation. So 
That's an elder. That's the first or preceptor. Then in the second stage, the person becomes, uh, they call it a kalyanamit or a spiritual friend. And that's kind of eye level. The person is like a guide. You know, the difference between a preceptor and a guide is the guide, um, you, you're at a, you, you go to visit, um, you know, um, uh, Rome, and uh, an elder tells you, oh, you should definitely go see the Parthenon or whatever, or what, you know, whatever, whatever um, you know, the Trevi Fountain, and it's over this way, and here's the map. But a guide will say, I'm going that way. I'm going to take you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the spiritual friend. So it's kind of eye level, and the teacher's kind of in your house and, in, you know, in your world and having meals with you and talking about all kinds of aspects of life. And that's still not a guru. Yeah. You know, there's a real sort of, um, you know, sense of actually communicating with somebody who has some, uh, you know, experience of the thing that you're looking into. Then in the kind of in the tantric tradition, the Vajrayana tradition, as it's taught in Tibetan Buddhism, then there's the idea of a guru, which is kind of very progressed, actually. And that person should be like a master. You know, yeah. they, they should really have, there should not be a lot of guesswork going on at that level. Right. What's going on. And people abandon all hope, anybody who thinks they want to become that, you know. You, you have to be out of your mind, basically, to right. want to want to become a guru. Yeah, right. What a pain in the ass, huh? What a disaster. That would be a real mess. Well, you'd have to be a completely accomplished bodhisattva. You'd have to really think that working for others is important. You'd have to kind of have a clarity of mind that is um, unshakable in a way. And, um, you know, there is a sort of indestructible quality to a certain level of accomplishment. Yeah. And you'll know when the, when that's going on. People shouldn't worry about it. I think that that's that's the wrong end of the stick to start with. You know, right? Yeah, it just I think it's if you're like we're talking about the way a lot of this stuff gets communicated to people is usually through cinema or through like fiction. And in that, you know, there's something really romantic about it, and there's something really cool about it. And so those big things get amplified, and the more subtle things completely get left out because you only have you know, an hour and a half to do the movie. What are you going to do? Like, you're going to show Dr. Strange, like being a little <laughs> less angry in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Get to the monastery. Get him knocking at the door. And then oh, that's the perfect. Movie. Yeah, and, and a whole scene where he's just like a little bit bored, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. yeah. The audience is looking at their watches, yeah. No, it's yeah, true. like him on the phone with... AT&T, like actually listening to the person on the other line, like oh. human, you, you can't, you can't yeah. do it. Okay. So I want to, one thing that I've been realizing is that the intention going, does the intention going into a practice matter at all? Yeah. Well, for example, you, you could ask the question the other way. If you don't have the intention to practice, would you actually practice? Mm. Oh, gee, I just tripped and I fell on my cushion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? You know, oh, that's, that's an incredibly cool accident. You're actually sitting, well, you might as well stay there for 15 or 20 minutes as long as you tripped. Yeah. So intention seems to precede everything. Mind leads is what I would say. Okay. Mind leads body. You know, you don't get up and, and go out and uh, mow the lawn accidentally. Well, what I mean is if so, but let's say that I, the reason that I've, I'm deciding to meditate is just the most greedy reason or something like I'm, oh. you know what I mean? Like I'm, 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 it's not that I'm not going to meditate, but it's that I've thought to myself, well, I'm pretty sure that if I start doing this over time, assuming like the reservoir of writing regarding this practice is not just crazy people writing and, and lying that the other side of this I'm probably gonna have some power i'm gonna probably have some ability to do things i i didn't have before i'm probably gonna get make some money from this like i'm probably gonna like this is probably gonna do i'm not doing this because i want to help everybody or some crazy shit like that i'm doing it because i want to be better i don't try to think of the most boring reason for me because i want to be better at golf yeah i'm going to start meditating so i can be better at fucking golf does it matter the intent going in 
Okay, so again, classically speaking here, really we're talking about motivation. Motivation comes first, and then you hone it into an intention, which is a declaration of like, I'm going to do this, but why are you doing it is what you're really talking about. Yeah. Does that matter why you're doing it? And the answer is yes, it does matter. And, you know, good teachers say check your motivation. It's good to check on it. And the best motivation classically is altruistic motivation, but, you know, that you, you, you have the sense, what, what they call the bodhicitta aspiration. You want to arouse a wakeful and cons- compassionate heart to share with others and to help other people also along their way. That's the, and we arouse that motivation in a lot of practices. You start there. You go, let's arouse bodhicitta as the, as the motivation, awakened heart. So um, if your motivation is greed, uh, power, um, you know, um, lust, whatever, uh, you know, it's like it, the way you start to move your bat in, when you swing at a baseball, it's going to go that way, you know? Right. So I think there is some sense of correct checking uh, at the beginning uh, what, what's going on. And having a good look in in the mirror as much as you can, and even you could recognize, oh, I'm, I I want to be famous. Or I want, you can see those things without necessarily just completely giving the bus driver, you know, letting them drive the, the bus completely. You could just see it, and it's okay. You could you could maybe acknowledge it, but having the bodhicitta aspirations better. See, that's to me. This is the I, the reason I asked you the question. I was watching this amazing documentary on flowers i think it was a chrysanthemum this thing's crazy it beetles it it has like it's filled with nectar and beetles fly into that nectar and they get stuck Uh. and there's only one way out and the way out is through this tiny little exit that when the beetle squirms through it gets the pollen on its back and there's, and, and then pollinates another flower. <laughs> and so I was thinking, Holy shit. You know, like when I, when, when, um, who is it? Marpa in uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, you know, his intent to go study Buddhism was there. There was some, yes. Right. There was some, right. I don't, I don't want to call it greed, but he was trying to make money. Right. Like well, it started yeah. off like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, I was just going to say, as you were talking about that, Duncan, it sounded like a, the the beetle is in a Vajrayana dil- dilemma. It goes for the you know that rich, luscious atmosphere, which is what the guru uh, energy is, is like. It's very compelling. It's not like any ordinary kind of uh, sense of you know conditional affection. It's it's very expansive. And then you get trapped in it. There's only one way out, which is through. Which is that's sort of what you would you know that might be a metaphor for you know for actually uh, that that type of uh, uh, study situation, but uh, the question really is: Is there something organic about the process where it's going to move in the right direction if you only allow or surrender to that aspect of it? Yeah. Do people have the bodhicitta already? You see what I mean? As a, or is this something I have to crank up? I have to think, oh, I'm just doing this to help others. Because that could be just totally phony too. Yeah, the you most know? phony. Yeah, I, I, I like those people scare me the most in a weird way. Oh, I'm just, I want to help. You know, it's like that, that can be kind of um, a superficial uh, and, and, you know, worth looking at more. So, um, yes, you're right. There, there, there's something organic in it. When we arouse the bodhicitta aspiration, we're actually touching into something that's quite, quite uh, familiar and, and, and quite natural for us. We, we, do, we are able to love and to, and to care for others and f- care for ourselves, and it is close to our truest nature. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the transition from mindfulness to bodhicitta in the sense that mindfulness can come across as a, a very... Um, intellectual, non-heart, heart-based, mm-hmm. you know, like, yeah. it, at least for me, when I've, it, it times in practicing, it's, it's just felt like very, and probably just because I hadn't been practicing enough, but there is a sense of like, um, 
Well, it's literally called mindfulness. Like it's well, the mind. Well, and headspace. And headspace, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, then what happens, you know, inevitably in discussions regarding this progression or the stages, you run into the bodhicitta thing. Heart space. Not, heart space. And now, and then, and all this time you've been doing this mindfulness, and now all of a sudden it's like, oh, you want me to fucking, you want me to love everyone like the way I love <laughs> my kid now? <laughs> and that's just, that would be devastating. Yeah. Like, you know, because, but maybe you could talk a little bit about this. Whenever I, because I can, the mindfulness stuff somehow is a little easier for me. Sure. When you get into the Tonglen thing. Sure. The Bodhicitta thing. Suddenly this is like, you know, it obviously I intellectually can understand. I want all beings to be happy. I want to have compassion. I want all beings. But, but can you feel that? No. No, the moment it's there's a all or a totality in it, it's just forget it. Like it's it's it doesn't make any sense to me, and because I can't picture all beings, you know what I mean. I can't picture everything, and so that's where I, I, I the whole thing falls apart. I can when they're saying things like think about uh, your, you know, your someone you love, your child, your wife, your someone you've wronged that you loved, and then when I get feel that stab in my heart that I've begun to understand is, is love, then I have some vague sense of, of it. But uh, yeah, I get real stuck here when it comes to bo bodhicitta or the, at least the way that I've. Well, studied. this is, this is why I thought the nuanced, you know, step uh, understanding progression could be really helpful because there, it is well mapped out. And that's one thing about Buddhism is you can, um, you can study it intellectually, and it's like it is a it, it is a clearly laid out description of something. You know, it's it, it, there's not a lot of like, well, just kind of just do. You know, I mean, it's it's there is a version of it that <clears throat> a well honed intellect can get get into and go. Okay, I see I see the the order of this situation. So the mindfulness gives you a sense of um, stability and presence, focus. And there's no doubt that if you do mindfulness meditation, you can develop focus. I mean, that's, yeah. that's uh, and, and it has certain other benefits, too, that spool off of that. So uh, you go from a very scattered kind of state of mind, distracted all the time, you know, um, you know bouncing around, and you are, learn to just kind of bring your attention back together to kind of one thing, and so stabilizing it. Step one. Okay. As we said, then step two is you start to, from that, that we call that the tripod, okay? You, you're kind of balancing the tripod. Now yeah. you put a camera on top of the tripod, it's going to take clearer pictures, and that's, that's Vipassana. You actually see clearly, oh, okay, I'm here, I'm present. Well, thoughts are coming and going. Yeah. Oh, I, I thought these thoughts were kind of permanently embedded or like I'm just accident, but they actually are coming out of nowhere and going nowhere. Yeah. And now it's five minutes later and I was bored. I was terribly bored five minutes ago and now I'm sleepy and yeah. five minutes later, now I'm horny. Yeah. You know, well, 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 there must be some space out of which these things are arising and dissolving back into. So Vipassana is the beginning of that kind of perception. Oh. Now, what's the nature of that space? Well, it's kind of empty. It's empty of the things that fill it intrinsically. There is no permanent lust there is no permanent aggression yeah. there's n no substantial qualities that are just glued into that space they arise and they dissolve so that is the beginning of the perception of, of what we call emptiness or shunyata you can actually get a glimpse of it it's like seeing the tail of a lizard as it scurries off onto out of your field yeah. of view that's how we experience emptiness it's just like a little yeah. bit of a glimpse yeah okay now that glimpse opens and what is in that glimpse is the beginning of cultivating compassion. Huh. Because compassion as just an, a kind of fabrication is yet another form. It's, just, it's like lust. It's just something you made up. You yeah. know? So, but when you see the tail of the lizard going off and there's a sense of space and openness, and then a little warmth comes up out of that. You see, a, you see that beetle in the flower. You see it. Yeah. And you go, oh, that touched my heart. 
yeah. something just organic just happened. That's non-dual compassion. That's what we're really working with. So yeah. it's not just cranking up another bunch of fabricated things. It, it, it really, the compassion and the emptiness are really very strongly uh, connected experiences. So that's important to understand. Yeah, I'm a that that's past my pay grade here. That's a, <laughs> that that's a, that like, I I've gotten as far as you know moments of I'm not saying I don't feel compassion or anything or, or that I don't have empathy or or like but you know I I've any time I get that ex- I, what I think you mean by the lizard's tail yeah. and feel the that, glimpse. 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 It's yeah. almost instantly followed by, fuck that. Like that's that. You know what I mean? That's painful. Like the the thing itself is not painful. Yeah. The lizard's tail is not what what I would call painful, but something about that depth of whatever that is for me, it reminds me. It reminds me of something that I guess I I have been trying to avoid or that that. Uh, is is painful, which is what loss. Okay, that's that's the seed of the compassion right there. What do you mean? Not avoiding that experience. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That seems for. I mean, is it? That's. Uh, I don't think it's intolerable. You know, I think it portray your mind will consider it to be intolerable, but I don't. I, but it's close to. Like the, and I, I, I'm I, like I don't even know if it's. I think maybe I think what happens is and is that that I start making up a a very complex story regarding it, and and that story is essentially well, if you go there, then you're going to lose everything. Like if you go there, then you're going to lose lose it. Like you're that's how can you be anything in that state or, you know, I, I don't know how to express it even. I sure. Think. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, there's, uh, I, I've told you this before, but Trung Rinpoche is saying enlightenment is ego's final disappointment. Yeah. Yeah. There's like not much of a re, 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 reward in, in the conventional sense. Mm. Mm. You know, and but I think Duncan, what comes to mind, and you know, we talk about first thought, best thought a lot, right? Yes. Because in our spontaneous communication, it seems like if you if if you allow that to surface, it has a lot of kick, you know, for the first thought. So when you were talking about it, frankly, I was thinking about your mother. Yes. And your eighth show. Yeah. On midnight, midnight gospel, the eighth show is I've said it before, is a real lesson for all of us. Uh, you know who 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 watched it for those who created it for you who lived it for your mom of just what compassion really actually feels like yeah because there's a lot of space in it yeah that's it wasn't you by her bedside going oh, mom come back you know it was really she really took you there into the bigger space and in that bigger space there's just this kind of warmth yeah. Now that's to me that I think when we, you're talking about this first date versus second or third date thing, this is where I think people just aren't aware that that number one that that is even a quality of mindfulness or boot or that or even that mindfulness is part of a process that leads to that. But this, but certainly, at least I have never in my life of hearing the term emptiness like until recently working with you ever or, or, or listening to Sharon Salzberger, even when I've read it, you know, in books by people who, who say it, I it's never has even like made it onto the radar. I overlook it. But this concept of space as being compassionate, yeah, that it's actually the same thing. Help me understand this. It's wild to me. Like I, I don't, I like, well, usually when I'm thinking of space, I don't think of inequality. Mm-hmm. I don't think, that, you know, I, or, or, you know, or I, mm-hmm. if I do think of equality, I think, well, it can't be equality because it's space. But, but I, this idea that that warmth is you're calling it before you start crying or that warmth before you turn away from it or the warmth before you like get it hammered is space. Is that what you're saying? Well, yes, in a sense, because, 
the problem with emptiness is it's the wrong word in my humble opinion. It is sort of a fairly literal translation of shunyata, you know, but you have to say what it's empty of because uh, that's what it's really getting at is you filled your bottle with a bunch of crap and, yeah. and it's empty of that crap and you're better off with it empty of that. Yeah. But that flower is also empty, but it's got that nectar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The nectar is empty, but it's still nectar. So um, it's a harder concept to get of understanding shunyata or, or emptiness as potentiality. Yeah. And in, in Vajrayana language, you don't speak of it the same exact way. You say it's as, and you're, you know, you're talking about Minjir Rinpoche or some of those uh, type of style of teachings. Space is very rich. It's very full. Uh, it's abundant. It has all the qualities in it, but none of them are solid and fixed in the way that we're conventionally used to thinking about them. It's empty of that. So most people have not had the opportunity, I think, to understand that word as being, I like to think of it as like emptiness, it's like a womb is empty. Your mother's womb was empty, and then it gave birth yeah. to, the, to the Duncan yeah. mobile, you know? Yeah. And all that that meant came out of that emptiness, that spaciousness. Yeah. So that's, I think, um, a harder concept to get to. And people, if you just go at it dry and intellectual, you go, oh, it's empty, man. It doesn't matter. And you become a nihilist. That's all. Right. You know? So it's like those moments, you know, the, like the, in this Minjur Rinpoche book, he literally says, bring to mind someone or an animal mm. or something that you mm. love mm. and imagine that that being is in pain mm. that feeling that's mm. where he's that's the feeling and uh, you know what that whoa that that got me because i thought about my chihuahua when he was sure. crying and just yeah. that feeling you're saying that that feeling not the preceding, like, God damn it, why didn't I take him for more walks? But that feeling yeah. you're saying is a quality of emptiness. That, 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 what that is. Because what he said is, think of it, the way he put it was immense vulnerability. Look at mm -hmm. how, you know, that, that vulner, that, because I know what he, it makes sense. And I feel, I can feel it. And it, it but, and I, I would say that, prior to me trying to like prior to the guilt it it, it 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 is a one it isn't a terrible thing it's the it's but to connect that with emptiness that's where that let's yeah. talk more about that that well that's what really to me separates out the buddhist approach because who would put those two things together yeah you know usually it's one or the other and if it's the if it's the connection and the compassion and the bliss, then it can become eternalistic and theistic, right? And you, you know, you've kind of solidified that realm. And if it's the emptiness piece, it becomes like, well, there's no, as you said, it's neutral. It doesn't have any qualities of its own. It's just kind of, you know, vacuous in, in that sense. And that's leans towards the nihilistic understanding, but who would put those together? Emptiness and compassion. Yeah. And can you, uh, you know, not make it into too much of a mind game. So maybe one way to experience emptiness is just to, like you described, the chihuahua, uh, the dogs are barking. That's, that's, that's empty. Yeah. What is it? Why isn't it empty? It's that it's just noise. It's just sound. It's beings making sounds. Yeah. And yet at the same time, it's very poignant. Yeah. That little being, I watched that commercial Duncan on TV. God, it's killing me on, on, I think they're playing on an MSNBC a lot about the, the, the dogs trying to make it through the winter months and oh, they're trying God. to ASPCA. And I just, you know, I just go, okay, I got, I can't bear this. You I know can't. what? I always think, Hey, put your fucking camera down and help the dog. Like, <laughs> <there's so many laughs> <shivering dogs. laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. How about feeding the dog? It won't be shivering then. <laughs> That's yeah. an interesting thought. What do they do? Do they drive through cities? Like, Hey, I've got it. Found a shivering yeah. dog. Get this yeah. guy here. Let's film it. Get some donations. The dogs are all union. I'm sure, you know, <laughs> they're, they're getting scale. Your dog but, sucks. at seeming sad. Get it. Yeah. Dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 
you know, uh, what are we trying to get at here is decency, I think would be a good word to throw into the mix. Just be decent. That's what I'm missing more than anything right now in the world. Yes. Just could you just, I don't care if we don't agree about that. Could you just be more decent? You know, and there's a sort of lack of um, decency. I'm not going to say civility. I think that's superimposed, you know. Yeah. But decency, you know, yeah. when somebody, you, you know, okay, you're right. You're, you're, it would be interesting when the camera stopped rolling, how they treated those animals, you know. That's yeah. a really interesting question. I, I, if, I, if I go to the decency, this is something we've talked about a little bit. It, if I'm able to, like, allow that place to hang out longer than you know like um this is a really cool thing that's happening right now there's all these fusion reactors that are starting to fire up and it's the Mm. craziest thing Mm. and they'll say it stayed on for 20 seconds which is the longest any of these things have stayed on apparently if you get them to stay on long enough then you have infinite energy on earth that's way safer than uh, fission reactors um but like if i can maintain that compassion pre-story compassion just that Mm. vulnerable sense yeah even not being able to maintain it but having at least at the very least being able to like plug back into those moments and then imagine if i were to expand it for longer than like however long it takes before i turn my back on it or distract myself from it then i guess i could understand that idea that a kind of wisdom would begin to exhibit itself yeah. out of that feeling. Like, how are you going to not be decent? Like, if you think about the way you felt the time you saw the thing you love most in the most amount of pain before you got angry because you thought the vet sucked or before you got angry at yourself, but mm-hmm. like just that feeling. Yeah. How are you in that state going to do anything shitty to anybody? Like, how are you going to be violent? How are you going to be cruel? How are you going to, I'm saying before the story starts. That it, it, again, first thought, you're describing Buddhahood. You know, remember Buddha's not somebody's name. Right. You know, oh, oh, that guy was Fred, you know. It, it's a state of um, a way to, a being that is, uh, maybe there was one person who completely embodied that possibility and, you know, was very lucid about how to communicate from that perspective. But it's not somebody's name, and it's not a thing. It's a kind of um, uh, sustained. So when you when you hear about some of these really great teachers, they sometimes talk about recognizing Buddha uh, quality of wakefulness. That's the, especially in the Dzogchen tradition, like the Minji Rinpoche. The main practice is not mindfulness per se, because it's too like me being mindful, you know, controlling thing. It's just recognizing the possibility of right now, literally right now, of being in, in awake. Mm. That quality is there, right? Right now, is it? Is yeah. it so? Okay. Yeah. But it, it very quickly floats, drifts back into a kind of myriad of thoughts and feelings and, you know, wandering mind. So the practice becomes recognizing awake frequently not just when you're on the cushion you know kind of flashing some kind of wakefulness during the day yeah just glimpse just the tail of the lizard yeah and then be not trying to sustain it <laughs> trying to hold on to it so that's the second thing where i think trunk was brilliant he said disown it wow. other people would just say dissolve you know touch touch that catch that glimpse and dissolve but doing it frequently come back, come back, come back. And then at a certain point, they talk about the kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, quality of uh, stability in, in that wakefulness. It, do, it doesn't leave. Many glimpses, letting go, and begins to become more of a, you're more familiar with it, and then you can rest there. And then they talk about, 24 7 can you do it even when you're asleep uh, <laughs> that's hard but you are uh, help me with this confusion you are doing it right isn't that that isn't if okay so if emptiness as we're calling it uh 
is the womb of all change, then really you're you're all, you're already doing you're doing it like you're already you're not it's not a thing that you do, yeah. but it's 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 all that's a actually that's what's going on. Well, that's why the language shifts in that perspective. Again, this is the nuanced approach. This is not what how you teach mindfulness to somebody who's just got their brain scattered all over the right. landscape. This is you use the word recognize. All right. What's recognizing though? Recognizing it's, what you just exactly said. What is the re- so? What's the recognizer? It's this is you know and like so. Okay. It's recognizing itself. Ah. Is recognition a quality of it? It 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 uh, it's the joke quality of it. It's the cosmic humor quality of it. Like if you looked in the mirror and you said, "Oh, there's Duncan." There's a joke there, right? I mean, who else could it be? Usually, there's a lack of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, I'm trying to write material to go on stage. <laughs> 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 but you recognize, oh, Duncan, yeah, you know, yeah. it's a little bit of a joke because it was uh, Duncan all along. You know, I, see, was, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's so the thing is recognizing itself. That's yeah. Mahamudra. It's, it's yeah. The, they they say the symbol is a symbol of itself. Tell uh, me a little bit about sw- trying to swim back. Okay, so yeah. in this case, what pop first thought, best thought, what pops into my head is someone who is. J- like been afraid to jump into like uh, the uh, on some stupid desert island, afraid to jump into the ocean. Jumps into the ocean, suddenly realizes not only is the water warmer than I thought it was, it feels amazing, and not only does it feel amazing, but I can breathe underwater. And not only that, but I don't think I need to stay on that island anymore. Why was I even on that island? <laughs> and then suddenly thinking, "Fuck that! I don't know. I only know the island." Can you talk about yeah. the swimming back to the island part? That yeah, you know what sure. I'm talking about? That thing of like, oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. What? Well, weir- weirdly, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. So um, that's that's interesting in itself because I could. F- you're talking about you get a sense of a bigger space, uh, yeah. you, you know, and then and then you go, but wait a minute, you know, and it's a sort of a snap back, like if you pull a rubber band and it kind of snaps yeah. back to yeah. like, look, at least I'm familiar with this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I know, I know how to be resentful and pissed off. <laughs> uh, you know, at least it's like, you know, um, you know, I ate this morning, Duncan, I left some brown rice out on the stove last night and I forgot to put it away. And then this morning I had a little bit of it for breakfast and I started feeling like, Ooh, I don't feel so good. And then yeah. I looked on Google and, it it develops spores and it makes you really sick. Oh my god! You know, so yeah, I'm fine, I think. But um, the point is that we go back to the familiar, even though it's been developing spores and really kind of making us quite sick. So that's where the notion of renunciation comes in. You have to you have to have some sense of renunciation um, of the island that you go. You know what? Uh, let, let me use my best mind here. This is not that great really yeah it may be familiar it may be comfortable but it's you know it's not really comfortable we always in in the world we always we love to use terms like too late you know in other words like <laughs> like that's a that's one of the qualities i think that we're, these days like a, the the uh when we're sort of real everyone's kind of collectively coming to a realization of just how toxic mm social media has become and you're looking at social media and you see like that's what that seems to be one of the favorite shitty things to tweet at someone today is like well too late shouldn't have done that now you're fucked forever Mm. but the reversal this to me seems like the reversal of that in the sense in this way of thinking is it possible that there's a sorry too late you're going to you're going to get enlightened. I, I'm sorry that it's too late. You're going to actually be in an ocean of compassion. Yeah. Sorry. You, you, but is there a point? Did you, have you ever found a point where, well, they call it non-returning literally. Wow. Non-returning. wow. You can't, you, 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 the island's gone. That. And, and, and that's an interesting thing in the sense that this, this is like, what a why have you like, that's a why that is that, so in other words, 
Buddha, theoretically, was there a point in, in the many incarnations of the Buddha? Was there a point in those incarnations or in the, in the prior to the first turning of the wheel of Dharma, as they call it, yeah. where that being was like, I don't know about this. Like, I think right up to the last moment, there was a possibility of reversal. Uh, and, and then um, what he would have called or what we would have called his you know, full uh, realization, that's actually saying it's not reversible. Now, people would argue about this, Duncan. This is a good Buddhist uh, debate topic. Yeah. Maybe Zen people would say there's no such thing. You don't talk about well, Who cares? Anyhow, you know. Yeah. Uh, but my understanding of it is that um, at that point, Buddha cannot go back to the island. The island is gone. And that's why that heart sutra, gate, gate, paragate, completely gone. The mm. island's gone. And even if it appears, it appears differently. It appears as a kind of relative phenomenon, clearly. It appears as something that could be serviceable or toxic, you know, depending on your perspective. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I think, um, you know, there is a progression there, and there is a difference between um, – that stage of realization, and there's many, you know, people have talked about, in, especially in these um, circles that we travel in, maybe somebody says, I had a Satori or I had some kind of realization. It means, it doesn't mean that much, you know, there's, because there's, if you're still talking about it, you know, um, if there's any clinging to it, that then it becomes another stage of the rocket that needs to get burned off, you know. Is that because for the, for that, moment of like holy shit i got enlightened or wow realization or whatever to happen it still involves a fixation on the uh, boundaries like in other yeah, words that, you, you uh, fixated on before and after thing and and, and what you're talking about is that you're that you are no longer fixated on boundaries you're you're playing a pretty slick version of a game that you still can't win really you know it's self-referential. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you can't win that game. That's the irony of it. Right. You can be Lord of the three universes. You can be president of the United States. You can be a, a, a super rock star, but you cannot win that game because at a certain point there's something there to lose. Is this like, if we're going to keep using the Island thing, is so <laughs> is it like going from Island to ocean or is it like going from Island to universe? Well, lately, and because of friends like you, I don't even think of universe. I think of multiverse. Ah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. like multiverse. I like the idea that it's and and in Buddhism they use a lot of big numbers of innumerable or countless or, you know, um, they say for example, if you practice Mahayana Buddhism, uh, you know, pretty you know strictly and stay with that exchanging self for others kind of program in three eons, three kalpas, um, you could attain realization, you know. Now, what's a kalpa? It's an immeasurable eon, you know. It's already, you're ready. And, oh, now you got to have three of those. <laughs> 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 you know, one wasn't enough. So, and they say just, you know, so I think the multiverse idea is it's beyond your ability to envision the, the expanse of it. Would okay. be a good way to look at it. And, and the rational mind gets, you know, is going to, freak out probably at a certain point yeah Are you go, mean is that a normal thing is that like just part of is that an acknowledged part of the thing is is the rational mind starts freaking out or is that an well again coming into the vajrayana that's one of the key roles of a quote-unquote guru type of relationship and again the guru is something embedded in oneself it's in the in the multiverse experience and it's in it can appear in the guise and form of a human being that you relate to but there's some uh, aspect of it going beyond your ability to conceptualize it and and manage the experience and that that's um you know uh, so one of the portals into that is panic it's an interesting thing when you panic, you can't wrap your mind around what's happening, right? Yeah. So one definition, like Rimsha used to say, well, the role of a, of a teacher is to make the student panic. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, again, very kind of 
evolved perspective on a, on, on, on a, on that kind of relationship. And, um, but just in the sense of like the, not getting comfortable with your ground, even if the ground is, is Buddhism per se. Or, that, or knowing the, that, pan you know? the panic part is an, again, another part. I don't know that people in the in introductory app classes that they're taking that you don't, no. you're not, you don't get a lot of indication that, Oh, you know, that is a possibility, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that peculiar you know, just through the practice of mindfulness, not even the bodhicitta phase of things, but just through the practice of mindfulness. And for me, there's an unnerving moments where it's like, I'll realize that every single thing I don't like, whatever it is, whether it's like the fucking new Taylor Swift album that everyone says they love or the like no offense Taylor Swift I, I I don't connect I like the great I don't I don't exactly have sophisticated taste in music but uh I like the Grateful Dead I'm not bashing Taylor Swift or Taylor Swift fans I you know I listen to I still listen to like bad trance music so I don't consider myself a musical sophisticate but uh what what I'm saying is those moments of where you realize that every single thing you don't like is just something you made up and you know what I mean? Just a thing, you know what I mean? But you know, there's a million other people out there who love the shit that you don't like. And then in that, there's a sense of like, God damn it. Well, that, that, that to me is, is, uh, has been some, a little unnerving somehow, which is that. Sure. Well, you know, uh, for whatever reason, help us, it helps us to create a grid and, uh, you know, sort of sense of parameters yeah. and, and form. And, the only problem in doing it is we we overdid it. We overcooked the goose. Yeah. So in relative reality, relative truth, you say it's okay to create a grid. You have a house. You have yeah. keys to the car. It's okay. But when it becomes maniacal, then it's worth you know maybe loosening the the the, uh, the strictness of the grid. And uh, in the perception that the grid is arbitrary, you can automatically loosen it. You go, okay, well look. Um, these things are shifting. I don't, I don't need to be a fanatic. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, I don't need to panic over the fact that there's a possibility all the things I don't like are. Yeah. Like you don't have to get that upset that Taylor Swift had sold a lot of records, you know, it's like, okay. Apparently she's amazing, but well, look, I, I don't mean to get yeah. to talk about Taylor yeah. Swift. I, <laughs> I, I bet I, she meditates. How much you want to bet? I bet she meditates. I bet a billion dollars. She meditates. I bet yeah. she's a really sweet, Person, I was, these, yeah. I'm getting so soft. I feel like such a. <laughs> I'm not making fun of her. My wife loves her. Everyone loves her. We just but, lost half your audience, though. I, I, I don't. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, the, the uh, and I haven't even listened to the album I'm talking about, so I heard it's really good. This is not the point. The, this is what I, I wanted to ask you, relating to Bodhicitta. Yeah, and, Bodhicitta. Um. And also what we've been talking about regarding that heart, the hard space and compassion being this quality. Uh, to a quality of emptiness or a, the, a, there's a vastness to this compassion. Mm. Um, Wrap can, on, brother. You're sounding good. Can you talk about the visual aspect of it? Like, in other words, like, like I, I, there's a kind of like, um, when we talk about emptiness, I think for a lot of people to hear, oh, actually, the thing we're calling emptiness, the next yes. is compassion, actually. Uh, but, and within that, it does produce a kind of qu a quality. Like, it's yes. not like there aren't qualities. Is there a visual quality to this compassion? Yes. First thought lucidity and vividness ah, okay you see it clearly without filters and it's got amazingly detailed that little shiver in the dog you know and just its little whiskers sort of vibrating ah. you know it's extremely vivid and it's lucid it's not you're not confusing it for something else and you're not overlaying on it so immediate vivid lucid what about um auditory well, that's interesting because now you're really getting close to the mind when you talk about the sense gates and how they operate. Yeah. 
so the auditory thing is probably more closely associated with feeling. What like what is you know when you hear like music, you know it makes you feel a certain way. Yes. So, um, but I would say also vividness, and clarity, but also a kind of resonance. Ah. Uh, you know? Yeah. yeah. And you can you can you, you empathy. You can resonate with that. You can feel that. Yeah. It's com- coming right through. Wow. What about smell? <laughs> what does compassion smell like? Yeah. Good God. Hey, I, you know what I've always liked? I like what Trump Rivers says that fresh baked bread, you know, a, a freshness. Um, uh, fresh. Yeah. Is that? But it's not always pleasant. <laughs> And sense of smell is really how we experience, uh, you know, um, repulsion. Yeah. And and attraction. And this doesn't smell right. Something doesn't smell right in this situation, you know. Yeah. Well, one. <laughs> this is a good one, man. Well, yeah, I mean, your sense gates are really getting close to the, the the gateway into. Um, real experience, you know? Yeah. Gets you, you out of your head a little bit, right? Yeah. Can you uh, address, for one last question, if you have time, we're, it's, uh, what time is it now? We're at 11.38. Do you have a time yep. for question? Yes, I do. Uh, can you address this idea in society in culture that this shit is supposed to be hard and the seeming paradox when you do encounter this spacious nectar like buoyant quality of compassion it seems almost just the opposite of that like there doesn't seem to be a lot of struggle if 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 that was to if you were to recognize that as your actual identity <clears throat> What about all the struggle stuff and all the like, this shit's supposed to be hard and painful and, you know, gr- your, your hands are supposed to be knotted and your back's supposed to be bent and you're supposed to be all withered. Well, just in all fairness, you look at the deities, you know, I was just reading Sansar, uh, can't say remember, article about what the deities are, Tara, green Tara. They're not all gnarled and bent over and in pain. Right. And they're representing some kind of quality and reality that is part of our true, true nature and that's embedded in the fabric of reality. And um, they could be, though, wrathful. They could be quite, you know, provocatively um, intense, you know, but they could also be, like, unbelievably beautiful. Yeah. And, and elegant, you know. So um, th- our sense of being gnarled and knotted is habitual, according to Buddhism. It's not intrinsic. Huh. It's it's impermanent. Huh. So that's uh, you know that's yeah you're going oh you, well, who told you have to be that way? Go back. Go take the take the you know look at the send it back. Yeah, that's so cool, ah, David. Nectar, you're the best. Thank you so much. I, these conversations are so wonderful. They keep getting better for me. Like every, you know, with the, especially with the practice happening, and it's so wonderful. So well, thank you. Know, and Duncan, a lot of your uh, friends out there come and they study more, which is a really good outcome from this. I think you know. Yeah. They take the teacher training program, or they take weekend workshops, and so. Um, they're really welcome. There's a little community inside the Dharma Moon world, which is my community. That's really a Duncan, like you got a, a, a reserved section in the yeah. house, you know. Right. So everybody's it. everybody's really welcome. I just I just feel like I want to say that. And um, what is it? I, I this is what a terrible friend I am. Is it like what is it? A website? Like, well, uh, why don't we post maybe some link on your. Uh, site when we post the talk and okay. people come. There's a lot of programs coming up that that Dharma Moon, which is my company, is doing in conjunction with Tibet House. 
So oh, if you go to, to bedhouse.us, you'll see like a teacher training and some open open workshops and things like that and um, some information sessions. And if you just go to, to bedhouse.us and you scroll down, you'll see it. Or you go to my website, davidnickturn.com, and we'll post. Maybe we can post something. But I, I really have developed a, a, a profound – it's like uh, our tribes c- crossed, you know, yeah. and, and, and people are really, really um, – you know, talking about this stuff in a, in a deepening kind of way, which is, um, there is nuance starting to come into it. And, and, um, it's really, I think that's our contribution. You know, there's a lot of people out there given the initial relaxation instructions, the initial mindfulness instructions, and we certainly do that, but I'm more interested in people kind of beginning to evolve their, 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 like well, the kind of conversation we're having is very, you know, rich, I feel. Yeah, I, I, I'm so lucky to have you as uh, my meditation teacher. And I'm, yeah, I highly recommend if any, if y'all are interested in Buddhism or mindfulness, definitely connect to these classes. I've taken them. They're, they're great. Uh, thank you, David. I, um, I look forward to chatting with you more. And also, I think we already mentioned it earlier, registering day, I think 11. We're at day 11. Day 11 registered okay and just that yeah so you you're texting me every day and i'm texting you back when you're doing meeting your energy challenge and i'm doing that with about 30 people right now My lord your phone must never stop How it's very, it's got to be very first thought i don't linger on it just, okay cool and some people are writing little haikus and sending a little video or a song there's a beautiful creative energy around it that's that's really refreshing actually so I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad I'm, I'm startled and glad. And it also has worked with a couple of people who frankly were having a hard time getting a steady practice going. It's yeah, been it worked skillful. Yeah, I, yeah. I need it. It's great. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, David. Okay, okay Duncan. Hare Krishna, thank you. Okay. Um.